Hi, I'm Rev Myron. I'm a minister through Pathways of Light. And I've been a Course in Miracles student for 40 years. I'm going through the lessons this year, asking Jesus to clarify for me, and then I'm writing from that clarity. So let's get started. Today, we're looking at lesson 153. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. This was a very important lesson for me. Paragraph one, you who feel threatened by this changing world, its twist of fortune and its bitter jest, its brief relationships and all the gifts it merely lends to take away again. Attend this lesson well. The world provides no safety. <clears throat> it is rooted in attack and all its gifts of seeming safety are illusory deceptions. It attacks and then attacks again. No peace of mind is possible where danger threatens thus. This can be a bitter pill to swallow. We so want the world to work. We try and try again to manipulate the world so that it makes us happy. When I first started studying the course, I did so with the idea that this was going to help me have a better life. Slowly, I came to the realization that this is not just another better self-help book. It's not another way to get more of whatever I thought would make me happy, money or relationships. None of my fan fantasies I thought I needed at the time were the goal. In fact, I discovered that A Course in Miracles is here to show me that there is no world and that I am just dreaming of separation and specialness. I discovered that waking up from the illusion of the world is the only way to achieve consistent, permanent happiness and peace of mind. Two, the world gives rise but to defenseless, defensiveness, for threat brings anger. Anger makes attack seem reasonable, honestly provoked, and righteous in the name of self-defense. Yet is defensiveness a double threat for it attests to weakness and sets up a system of defense that cannot work. Now are the weak still further undermined for there is treachery without and still a greater treachery within. The mind is now confused and knows not where to turn to find escape from its imaginings. Our previous lesson told us that we hold all the power. Our thoughts and beliefs determine the world we see and how we see it. It told us that no one nor anything outside ourselves is responsible for our lives. Now we're being given another very important piece of the puzzle. Jesus starts by establishing the fact that the world doesn't provide us safety. And this can be frightening to those who look for it here. The danger isn't in the world itself, but in the confusion we experience as we try to defend ourselves. When we feel attacked, we become angry and believe that it is reasonable and even necessary that we defend ourselves through fighting back. The problem with this is that defending ourselves just makes us feel more vulnerable. The more we defend, the greater the threat becomes to us and the more frightened we become. As Jesus says, we start out with feeling attacked by the world and now our own mind is causing the sense of attack to be even more frightening. From the ego perspective, there seems to be no way out of this since attack calls for defense and defensiveness breeds more attack. Three, it is as if a circle held it fast within another circle bound it and another one in that, and no, until escape no longer can be hoped for nor obtained. Attack, defense, defense, attack becomes the circles of the hours and the days that bind the mind in heavy bands of steel and lay, iron laid, still with iron overlaid, returning but to start again. 
there seems to be no break nor ending in the ever tightening grip of the imprisonment upon the mind. Four, defenses are the costliest of all the prices which the ego would exact. In them lies madness in a form so grim that hope of sanity seems but to be an idle dream beyond the possible. The sense of threat the world encourages is so much deeper and so far beyond the frenzy and intensity of which you can conceive that you have no idea of all the devastation it has wrought. When I first began to get even an inkling of what Jesus is saying here, I felt a sense of hopelessness. I could see that he was right. I'd spent my life trying to defend myself. My relationships were battlegrounds, even when there was relative happiness. My mind was always devising strategies to defend against the next attack. Sometimes I was planning how to get my way. Sometimes I was thinking of justifications to explain my behavior. And at other times I was busy trying to make myself look better, behave better, make myself more valuable to defend against the loss of the relationship. Work was no different. I was always vying for top position, defending myself against competition within the company and competition against other companies. The weirdest part of the whole thing was that I didn't really notice that this was happening nor did it occur to me that there was any other way to live. And all this striving did nothing to make me feel safe. It just drove me to greater lengths to defend myself. Five, you are its slave. You know not what you do in fear of it. You do not understand how much you have been, you have been made to sacrifice who feel its iron grip upon your heart. You do not realize what you have done to sabotage the holy peace of God by your defensiveness. For you behold the son of God as but a victim to attack by fantasies, by dreams and by illusions he has made, yet helpless in their presence, needful only of defense by still more fantasies and dreams by which illusions of his safety comfort him. I understand now that defensiveness is a trap. The more I defended, the more vulnerable I felt. When I fell into this trap, I became hypervigilant for signs that attack was imminent and often saw threat where there was no attack. The worst of it was that I could not know myself when I was defensive. What, was the holy, what has the Holy Son of God got to defend against? What could threaten my true self? Could God's son be endangered? And yet I felt endangered. So it hid from me what I truly was, what I truly am. My son and I had a falling out that caused us to rethink our relationship. My thought was that I was guilty of making mistakes that threatened the relationship. I also thought he was guilty for not offering amends for his errors. I kept bringing these attack thoughts to the Holy Spirit and eventually I stopped thinking that I needed his amends and peace was restored in that area at least. But I failed to forgive my part in the situation and I thought that he held it against me because I believed that his actions always seemed to prove me right. If he failed to make his weekly call, I thought it was because he didn't wanna to talk to me. If he made the call, I thought it was because he felt obligated to make it. And yes, on some level, I realized that this was not reasonable, but it was how I felt. Then one day he brought his new girlfriend to visit. She told me that she was excited to meet me because my son was always talking about what a great mom I am. I had to laugh. Months of thinking that he was still angry with me and that maybe the relationship would never return to normal and nothing was happening, nothing except thoughts in my mind. Those thoughts were based on the belief that I was guilty and so unlovable. I think that maybe that belief has been undone now. After all, I had been defending against fantasies all along. <laughs> maybe I'll notice next time before it gets away from me. 
Six, defenselessness is strength. It testifies to recognition of the Christ in you. Perhaps you will recall the text maintains that choice is always made between Christ's strength and your own weakness seen apart from him. Defenselessness can never be attacked because it recognizes strength so great attack is folly or a silly game a tired child might play when he becomes too sleepy to remember what he wants. Defensiveness is weakness. It proclaims you have been you have denied the Christ and come to fear his father's anger. What can save you now from the delusion of an angry God whose fearful image you believe you see at work in all the evils of the world? What but illusions could defend you now when it is but illusions that you fight? The reason we need no defense is that we have nothing to fear. We are not these weak and fragile bodies. We are not these stories of of our lives, though we see and feel from the perspective of these bodies, we're not them, nor are we in them, nor is there actually a threatening world, except in our minds. The world is a memory of something that never happened and is playing out in our mind again. Until we open our minds to our true nature, we will continue to feel threatened, forgetting that the threats are illusions. The threats will increase with every defense we make. This occurs until they bind us tightly and fear becomes so common that we forget what safety feels like. We forget that God is love and so are we. We forget that we're invulnerable and immortal. Eight, we will not play such childish games today for our true purpose is to save the world and we would not exchange for foolishness, the endless joy our function offers us. We would not let our happiness slip by because a fragment of a senseless dream happened to cross our minds and we mistook the figures in it for the Son of God, its tiny instant of, of for eternity, its tiny instant for eternity. So it's like we're playing this incredibly realistic video game the kind with the best virtual headgear in the world. It's so realistic that we get caught up in it. We have played for such a long time that the game feels like reality and reality feels like an impossible dream. It is time to walk away from the game and return to reality. The game keeps showing us more monsters to slay and because we've become confused and think the monsters are real, we're afraid to turn away from them. But if we don't take that step, put down our shields and swords and turn away, we will remain in endless battle when we could be in, in eternal safety. Nine, we look past dreams today and recognize that we need no defense because we are created unassailable without all thought or wish or dream in which attack has any meaning. Now we cannot fear, for we have left all fearful thoughts behind. And in defenselessness, we stand secure, serenely certain of our safety now, sure of salvation, sure we will fulfill our chosen purpose as our ministry extends its holy blessing through the world. 10. Be still a moment and in silence think how holy is your purpose how secure you, you rest, untouchable within its light. God's ministers have chosen that the truth be with them, who is holier than they, who could be sure than his happiness is full, that his happiness is fully guaranteed, and who could be more mightily protected. What defense could possibly be needed by the ones who are among the chosen ones of God by his election and their own as well? We have been given a gentle way to disentangle from the games we play, a way that will not frighten us. I know that often when we get to the point that we realize there may be a way to freedom, we wish that the Holy Spirit would just shake us awake, <laughs> that our Father would just bring us home. Sometimes we feel anger that he abandoned us here and resentful that he doesn't just end the whole thing. But sudden awakening would be fearful, and our Father knows we don't need him to rescue us. 
He created us and he knows his creation is exactly like him. Does God need to be rescued? If he rescued us, he would be teaching us that we are not what, what he created. Instead, he gave us the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth to guide us as we rescue ourselves. Now Jesus has given us these simple lessons to smooth the transition and make it as painless as possible. We're not asked to give up all defenses at once while we're still uncertain of who we are. He is taking us by the hand and leading us out step by step. He tells us that we can heal ourselves when we are sick, but that if we're afraid to do that, we can give medicine the power to relieve our suffering. He explains how defensiveness hurts us and keeps us trapped. And then he teaches us how to lay them down one at a time as we notice and we discover that he is right. 11, it is a function of God's ministers to help their brothers choose as they have done. God has elected all, but few have come to realize his will is but their own. And while you failed to teach what you have learned, salvation waits and darkness holds the world in grim imprisonment. Nor will you learn that light has come to you and your escape has been accomplished. For you will not see the light until you offer it to all your brothers. As they take it from your hands, so will you recognize it as your own. As he does throughout the course, Jesus emphasizes that we must include our brothers in our salvation or we're not saved. How is it that we can help our brothers choose as we have? The way I do this is that when a brother lashes out, I don't defend myself. I don't try to make them feel guilty or in any way act as if I've been threatened or hurt. At first, this seemed dangerous, but now I see it was actually the way out of this false sense of danger we feel when we believe the game is real. It is a way we back out of the game. Now, I don't respond simply because I don't believe I am endangered. If someone were going to hit me, I would duck. If someone were abusing me, I would leave. But I would not feel like I am endangered because his body was endangered. I would not leave in anger or resentment. I would just leave. This was not always true, of course. It is through the practice of these lessons and the growing desire to return home that I have seen that it is true. I have gradually come to understand that there is only love or a call for love. If I answer a call for love with defensiveness, I will further trap myself in my delusions. Since I am no longer altogether insane, I've stopped hurting myself in that way. If someone calls for love, I give love. 12, salvation can be thought of as a game that happy children play. It was designed by one who loves his children and who would replace their fearful toys with joyous games, which teach them that the game of fear is gone. His game instructs in happiness because there is no loser. Everyone who plays must win, and in his winning is a gain to everyone insured. The game of fear is gladly laid aside when children come to see the benefits salvation brings. 13, you who have played that you are lost to hope, abandoned by your father, left alone in terror in a fearful world made mad by sin and guilt, be happy now. The game is over. Now a quiet time has come in which we put away the toys of guilt and lock our quaint and childish thoughts of sin forever from the pure and holy minds of heaven's children and the son of God. So the game we played is that we were tossed out of paradise by an unloving and vengeful God. We were left to fend on our own in constant competition with each other for whatever we could hope to gain. We're playing at being unloved and uncared for. We seem to be in a state of unending war with others and within ourselves, but all that is ending now. We have made a decision to put down our defenses and to come home. Our loving father has designed the happy game that has only winners. We're learning that salvation is something we want. 
14. We pause but for a moment more to play our final happy game upon this earth. And then we go to take our rightful place where truth abides and games are meaningless. So is the story ended. Let this day bring the last chapter closer to the world that everyone may learn the tale he reads of terrifying destiny, defeat of all his hopes, his pitiful defense against a vengeance he cannot escape is but his own deluded fantasy. God's ministers have come to waken him from the dark dreams of his story, dark dreams that this story has evoked in his confused and bewildered memory of this distorted tale. God's son can smile at last on learning that it is not true. So our part is twofold. Our purpose is to, to accept the atonement for ourselves, and to help our brother do the same. As for myself, I've not completed my purpose entirely, but what I have accepted thus far has convinced me that it is only in my defenselessness that my safety lies. I might still defend myself at times, but as soon as I do, I recognize the error and I choose again. I do this because I've proven to myself that Jesus is right, that my salvation and the salvation of the world depends on me making this choice for freedom. There is no salvation until I accept my salvation and I'm not saved until all others are saved. We're in this together. And so I want only the best for everyone. 15, today we practice in a form we will maintain for quite a while. We will begin each day by giving our attention to the daily thought as long as possible. Five minutes now becomes the least we give in, to preparation for a day in which salvation is the only goal we have. 10 would be better, 15 better still. And as distraction ceases to arise to turn us from our purpose, we will find that half an hour is too short a time to spend with God. Nor will we willingly give less at night in gratitude and joy. 16. Each hour adds to our increasing peace as we remember to be faithful to the will we share with God. At times, perhaps a minute, even less, will be the most that we can offer as the hour strikes. Sometimes we will forget. At other times, the business of the world will close on us and we will be unable to withdraw a little while and turn our thoughts to God. There's now an even greater emphasis on meditation, on sitting in stillness and allowing our mind to be healed and remembering who we are. We're encouraged to spend as much time as we can with this. He does understand that we will be distracted and sometimes fail to give these hourly remembrances, but we're asked to do the best we can. Maybe you have by this time gained at least enough peace and happiness from your practices that you understand the importance of what is being asked of you. The more time you devote to the lessons, to the time spent with your true self, the more this happiness and peace increases. 17, yet when we can, we will observe our trust as ministers of God in hourly remembrance of our mission in his love. And we will quietly sit by and wait on him and listen to his voice and learn what he would have us do the hour that is yet to come while thanking him for all the gifts he gave us in the one gone by. This is really important. We need to cultivate this relationship with the Holy Spirit. I did it by using meditative writing in which I would ask a question of him and then start writing what comes into my mind. The more I did this, the clearer the answer became. That is just one way to do it. If we practice these lessons as indicated, we will develop the ability to know the answer as we sit in silence. We can also receive correction for our thoughts and the healing of our minds in the same way. 18. In time, with practice, you will never cease to think of him 
and hear his loving voice guiding your footsteps into quiet ways where you will walk in true defenselessness. For you will know that heaven goes with you, nor would you keep your mind away from him a moment, even though your time is spent in offering salvation to the world. Think you he will not make this possible for those who chose to carry out his plan for the salvation of the world and yours? This is my experience, and it becomes more so all the time. Nineteen. Today, our theme is our defenselessness. We clothe ourselves in it as we prepare to meet the day. We rise up strong in Christ and let our weakness disappear as we remember that his strength abides in us. We will, will remind ourselves that he remains beside us through the day and never leaves our weakness unsupported by his strength. I love that sentence. I'm going to read it again. We will remind ourselves that he remains beside us through the day and never leaves our weakness unsupported by his strength. We call upon his strength each time we feel the threat of our defenses undermine our certainty of purpose. We will pause a moment as he tells us, I am here. Ooh, what a thought, right? Hey, so if I ever feel like I can't do some part of this work, this is a paragraph I come back to. I'm not alone and I have so much help. Let us rise up strong in Christ today, remembering who we are and who remains with us throughout the day. If I ever think for even a moment that I am in need of defense, I will call upon his strength and hear his voice tell me, I am here. 20, your practicing will now begin to take the earnestness of love to help you keep your mind from wandering from its intent. Be not afraid nor timid. There can be no doubt that you will reach your final goal. The ministers of God can never fail because the love and strength and peace that shine from them to all their brothers comes from him. These are his gifts to you. Defenselessness is all you need to give him in return. You lay aside but what was never real to look on Christ and see his sinlessness. We are the ministers of God and as such we cannot fail. It is his strength and peace shining within us that reminds me that God gave all of himself to me and my creation. How could I fail? <laughs> I gladly lay aside all my defenses as I am able. And in doing so, I accept my reality. Thank you so much for sharing this lovely le lesson with me. And if you found this helpful, then please like it. And if you haven't yet, please subscribe. And I'll be back tomorrow with another lesson.